Welcome to Street Knowledge. I am Chris Graham, and I've got Scott German with me here. We're going to talk some UVA football as Cavs coming off the bye week. Following that big win over Boise State a couple of weeks ago, start ACC play on Saturday, 12-20 kickoff in Charlottesville with Duke coming into town, and Duke coming in off a 31-6 loss to Miami. So, Interesting to me, Scott, that uh, despite, you know, what I just said there, Virginia on the road beating Boise State 42-23 a game that wasn't even that close, Miami coming in off of a big blowout loss at home to Miami, still, still a two-point favorite in this, in, in, uh, as we head into Saturday. Uh, your thoughts heading into this matchup? You mean you do that back? Well, I'm not really surprised that Virginia is the underdog. I think there's still plenty of naysayers out in um, Vegas that – might not be quite sold on this UVA resurgence uh, as we are, or hopefully we are. So, uh, you know, Duke's a solid team. And Virginia, you know, we don't know. We still don't know. The season's getting a little old, but we still don't know exactly the quality of wins that we've gotten, how Boise State, as we talked off the air, has not played since uh, losing to Virginia last Friday night. They play Saturday against BYU, so that might be a good indicator to see how they respond. So I think the verdict is still out to most of the, for most of the pundits as far as can Virginia play a full 60 minutes of football against a quality uh, as ACC foe. It is at home, so you have to think that home field is going to give us some advantage, but lately home field hasn't really meant a lot to Virginia. I'll throw two things out. Talking Boise State. Now they didn't play last week, as we both mentioned. So let's let's look back in their recent history this season. They played two games earlier this season that uh, these two teams might might ring a bell with you. What they did this past weekend, they struggled in their opener to beat Troy. Troy went this past weekend beat LSU at LSU. Uh, they also then Boise State the following week had a three touchdown lead in the fourth quarter, blew it, lost in three overtimes to Washington State, who beat USC this past weekend. So, so you know, I, I, Scott, was saying, you know, after the win over Boise State, well, I'm not too sure, you know, maybe this isn't your father's Boise State. Uh, they, they they left home against Troy. They they lost to this Wazoo team, and who knows how good they are. Eh, those two teams are a little better. Uh, this Duke team does have a win over Northwestern. Northwestern played Wisconsin tough last uh, this past weekend. Uh, but then, yeah, that blowout loss to Miami was a surprise. Uh, my, uh, Duke was actually favored uh, going into that game, and Miami controlled all the way. Now, let me point this out to you. Since I'm pointing things out, uh, Virginia. Last time we had a shot, last week we thought we had a shot at a winning season it was 2014. We started out four and two that year, and actually had a two and zero record in ACC play heading into a mid October game at Duke. Played Duke well, couple turnovers, uh, bad. Special teams play. You kind of heard that story before. Virginia lost that game to Duke and ended up losing five of the last six. So we've been in this position before, uh, going into a game with Duke with a chance to win for Virginia this weekend. If you're four and one and it went over Duke, went over Boise State, uh, you know, go ahead and make your travel plans for December. Uh, you're going to be playing in a bowl game. But you know, yeah, we, we've been here before. We we when we kind of looked back after uh, after going into this game with a with a Duke team that. It's still pretty good. They're four and one coming into this game. Well, you stole a little bit of my thunder because I was going to refer back to just a couple of years ago uh-huh. uh, when we were riding kind of high, uh, and then ran up uh, uh, against Duke and lost. Um, had chances to win in that game, if your memory yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, is decent. I mean, had many chances to win. Probably should not have lost. Uh, yeah. And then after that loss, the wheels completely fell off the wagon. So. Um, here, here's where I'm, I think personally, and, and I'm, uh, you know, self-admitted Homer, uh, here's where I think the difference could be, uh, in that Duke Virginia game a few years ago, even the most ardent UVA fans watching that game probably, and, and if you notice the fans are thinking this, it's got to be creeping into the minds of, of the players, or at least some of them. What are we going to do to screw this up? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I think the difference is now is that these, these, these kids are buying into, hopefully buying into Broncos system, and it's building confidence, so they're not waiting for the, shoe to, the other shoe to drop. 
they're waiting to drop something, you know, and, and, and I, I believe that might be the big difference here is that we're, we're playing a lot more confident and we're not out there thinking, okay, it's just a matter of time before we do something stupid, we make a bad call, we have too many players on the field, uh, we, we, we inadvertently call a time, we call a timeout when we shouldn't or should call a timeout when we shouldn't, uh, things like that. I believe this is a different uh, mentality, at least my opinion, what I'm seeing. Hopefully it, it um, plays out on Saturday, but that, that they're just playing a lot more confidence. And I don't think there's anybody that would say Duke's got a tremendous amount more talent. They're just well coached. And they know they're they play within the system of Cudmus, and uh, so you know I, I'm I'm hoping for for good things. You know I'll, I'll come off your point there. I, I totally agree with the confidence. When, you know Scott, you and I were among the many stoppers who talked about uh, when when Bronco Mendenhall said he's going to change the culture. Every coach comes in and says going to change. Comes into a program uh that that's had you know limited success, no success over a period of time. New coach. I'm gonna change the culture of this school. I'm gonna change the culture of this program. Didn't see it last year, you know, uh, in that two and ten season you finish up with a uh, you know the seven game losing streak. Did not sense change in culture. But I'll tell you, a couple of Friday nights ago, uh, at Boise State, you could see uh as that game wore on, that Virginia team had not gone into that game thinking, hey, if things go perfectly we don't commit a turnover. We get them to commit a couple turnovers. We might win this game by one point in the last play. They went in that game thinking they were stomp on their throat and, and, and bleed them dry, and they did that. And you can see as that second half went on particularly, the, the, the dancing on the sidelines, the, 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 the celebratory mood. I wouldn't say celebratory or dancing in an in a, in a, uh, arrogant way. I would say in a, gosh, isn't this fun? We're finally having fun out here kind of way. Uh, and the fan base has picked up on it. If you look at the message boards, if you look at Twitter and Facebook, Virginia fans are smiling like, hey, it's been a long, long time since we've been able to be proud this time of year about our football program. And uh, But those guys on the sidelines is where it starts. And uh, I, I think you're right, Scott. I mean, I think they don't they don't go into these games out thinking, hey, maybe, you know, maybe if things go the right way, we might win a game. You're right. Three years ago, that game at Duke, I was at that game. I actually covered that game from the press box there at that small stadium at Duke, Wallace Wade Stadium. Uh, the press box is they double during the week as a medical center building. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, they, they, Virginia outgained Duke severely in that game, but turnovers, bad, bad field position, bad special teams. I mean, yeah, you know, you're waiting for the wheels to fall off. You're going to trade in the fourth quarter. Under Mike London, the last couple of years of Mike Rowe, uh, I think uh, the, the team was uh, in that mindset of, hey, what are we going to do in this field again? And I, I, I'm with you, Scott, I think that now, you know whether they go out and win or lose, they, they they're going out to win, and, uh, and 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 that is a huge that's a huge difference from where we've been the last several years. Absolutely. Uh, side story, and I'm not going to not going to mention a name because the conversation we had was certainly not on record. It was more it was it was strictly a friend to friend. I uh, had dinner with an ex UVA coach, uh, football coach. Uh, back to the George Welsh era, and it was after the Boise State win, and we we talked a little about football, not not a lot, but we did touch on it. And he made a couple of uh, observations that that kind of led me up to talking a little bit about the difference in the mentality, the confidence that the players seem to be um, seem to be displaying on the field, and that this this individual was not really 100% sold on the Mendenhall hire for some of the reasons that we discussed, that he coached at BYU, completely different system, a completely different university than than Virginia, uh, with the players being able to go away for a couple of years and coming back as men, uh, with uh, being able to be selective on your scheduling as to when you play these so-called quote unquote big teams, uh, um, not having recruited on the East Coast, basically bringing his, his entire staff with him, who also hasn't been acclimated to the East Coast. So this particular individual has some has some reservations about the hire, 
And of course, last year didn't do a lot to to rid any one of those. But he said that the the thing that he really felt like there might be something to Mendenhall as far as a system. And then, like you said, everyone talks about when they come in, we're installing a new mentality. We're installing a new uh, system. Uh, everything is going to be changed. Every coach says that. Um, but there might be something a little bit to Mendenhall's uh, words, more than just words. And he, he saw this, and he thought that there could be more than this when – when both of the players that we thought um, were going to be leaving decided to stay, and you and I questioned it, we couldn't understand it. Uh, we didn't. We thought it was silly. We thought it was just risking their NFL careers. Uh, but they might. They saw something, and that maybe not just wanted to be a part of a winning program, but but that maybe that coaching staff could help them develop into even better players, where with the time under London, they really weren't. And the the other thing this ex-coach said to me was, there's a lot of players that just left, and there was a, a lot of mention about it, uh, that players that just weren't able to buy into his system. And so, you know, um, I'm hoping that that, that, that does – prove out to be some some validity in that and that uh that some of these players are just seeing the different techniques and we know coach london was a a wordsmith but not much substance to it coach mendenhall seems to be able to back up what he's what he's preaching yeah i would say i remember at the act football kickoff uh talking with michael kaiser uh Actually, this year it was Clint Blaney. Last year was Michael Kaiser. This year, we're talking with Clint Blaney. I want to just say to him, okay, I'm not asking you a question now. I'm just going to tell you as a fellow, as, as a you know, UVA alum, you're going to be a UVA alum. Soon. You should have gone, kid. You should, you know, did you did you did you not learn from one of the best 20 years ago? Uh, and and then kind of shake him a little bit and say, but you're not you're going to do this for a team that's not going to win. Obviously, you know, looking back, I mean, we're three and one. There's a lot of football still to be played, but. But uh, three wins is more than I thought this team would have all season, so I'll give them credit for that. They've already they've already surpassed my expectations in that sense. Um, I would also say that that that's, that's more of the behind the scenes cultural kind of stuff. I would say on the field, what I've seen, and I, and I uh, noted this talking with someone in the press box uh, at the last home game, uh, the Connecticut game, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago now. Uh, defensively, it seems like. You know, last year, it's, you know, guys were, were kind of late getting to, to the play. You know, they, they weren't flying the ball. They were still kind of thinking while they were running, and you can kind of see that. I mean, you know, guys, guys were, you know, receivers were running past them, running backs were running through them. But yeah, I, I sensed that it was more because they didn't know where they were supposed to be and what the scheme was. I'm noticing this year uh, that it feels to me like they, they're, they're now – they're not thinking anymore. They're just playing. You know, now the system is ingrained. Uh, and they're playing. And then on top of that, uh, one thing that's a clear difference with this team uh, as opposed to the London era from a couple of years ago is a lot of these guys, of course, the guys who are playing right now, largely the guys who are significantly contributing are still London guys, uh, is, the, is the level of fitness. Uh, the fitness level of these guys, uh, the strength level of these guys, guys have bulked up in a good way. Uh, you know, it's 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 noticeable uh, out there uh, that, that you know they're fat. They, we got faster guys, stronger guys, especially defensively. Uh, and uh, I'll give this staff credit too. Uh, they can, last year the offensive line was horrible. Uh, this year it's pretty much the, the guys from last year plus a couple of transfers they've inserted in the lineup. Uh, and this year, the line's great. They've given up six sacks, three in the first week. That's third best in the ACC in terms of lowest number. Uh, six sacks through four games. Uh, there, there, there's the, off, the running game. The running game is going to be close to four yards a carry after the first two weeks when they weren't running the ball very well. They've given Baker plenty of time to stand back there and throw the ball. He's only committed one turnover this year, uh, but the line is the key there. So all this said, yeah, it's, it's like, hey, you know, it, it's sunk in. They're playing football now. They're not thinking, and that's, that's also very important. Keeping Vink hurt upright is a good thing. And it's key. It's, 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 it's uh, pretty 
pretty spare behind him. I'll, I'll go to the press conference from uh, Bronco this week on Monday. A uh, question was asked of him again. And we were the first to bring this up, actually. Scott and I were the first to bring this up, as you're listening out there. Uh, after the Indiana game, uh, Scott and I had uh, a discussion on the blog that night and then uh, on our podcast the next week about, okay, Virginia, you know, losing that Indiana game, they were down 17. Why do you bring Baker back out in the fourth quarter? And we were discussing that back and forth. And eventually I came to the conclusion, hey, maybe they're trying to save him for a red shirt. following week, the Connecticut blowout win, and he didn't play. And uh, Brinker's out there in a blowout win, kind of, you know, mopping up the game. And, and Minderhall was asked about that. And, uh, again, at, at the end of the Boise State game, Devontae Cross finally saw a couple snaps that hurt. They bring Binker back out there. Uh, again, uh, Binker asked this, or uh, uh, Minderhall asked this week, uh, you know, about the situation with Lindell Stone as the backup. And he reiterated that, ideally, uh, he is, he is uh, redshirting this year. Uh, that's ideal, though. I mean, that's the thing. In football, your quarterback's always a play away from being your former quarterback, and your backup's always a play away from being the starter. So, uh, but best case scenario, yeah, if, if Baker is upright for 12 games, uh, we're probably playing a 13 and maybe even a 14th game this year. Uh, and uh, but that, that's key because he he has been wiped out this season. Baker 10 touchdown passes, just one interception, 66.1 percent completion uh, percentage, 10 percent better than last year, 10 points higher than last year. I mean, you know, th- these are these are numbers of elite quarterbacks, and we've, it's only four games into the season, but he's playing like a, you know, like an all AC former. He's playing like a quarterback that might actually um, be of interest uh, come April for the NFL draft. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's he's a prototype NFL fast player. Uh, so, you know, again, the key to he's it. Got a big <laughs> arm. Yeah. He's got a big arm. Uh, big kid. Uh, um, the key to it is keeping him healthy because if yeah. he goes down, uh, then we, you know, are, we're just not, we're, we just do not have that depth, uh, that we can pick, pick up like they're, you know, like, like everything is status quo. Uh, but that's with a lot of teams. That's, uh, I'll give you one team. The same thing applies. You wouldn't think it. Florida State has the same, had, had the same situation. Yeah. Um, they lose their, Starting quarterback, and they're out of the top twenty-five, and you know, they'll probably be lucky to finish above five hundred this year. Yeah, they had to rally uh, and have a couple breaks to their way to beat Wake Forest. And what I thought, you know, that's playing Wake Forest. Wake Forest came in that game unbeaten, but uh, but yeah, you go from being number three preseason to you know barely being able to win at Wake Forest uh, to get your first win at the end of September. Yeah, you're right. It's and that's that's the prescription for a lot of the programs. I would like to think that. It could be the same kind of situation at Virginia Tech. Josh Jackson has looked really good. Didn't look so good against Clemson this past weekend. But, uh, you know, he's put up good numbers this year. But, you know, what, is, what, what does anybody have at number two uh, that, uh, uh, you know, can do? But, but at, in Virginia's case, it's not just what it does short term. I mean, you go to a, red, a true freshman quarterback uh, in Lindell Stone most likely, but also then he said, you know, that we, we talked about this on the podcast before uh, folks who are listening in, but, if Virginia has to go to Stone this year, uh, you know, that, that's one less year of eligibility you have when he's actually going to be established uh, down the line. You'd rather have his fifth year than his, his true first year. Uh, but that said, you know, you look at the numbers, uh, not just Pinkert's numbers, you know, all those numbers I told you earlier, 10 touchdowns, one interception, 66% completion. The guys he's, he's thrown the ball to, Andre Lavroni, uh, we've known Lavroni uh, has been, uh, he, he, he had a potential to be a threat. He's having a 26.8 yards catch, four touchdowns among the 13 receptions. You got uh, Donnie Dowling out there doing the job. Uh, you know, the, the, the past couple of seasons, Virginia's passing game was throwing the ball to Taekwondo Mazel out of the backfield, uh, and uh, that's nice. Uh, and you know, Mazel was a good receiver, actually a elite running back receiver. Uh, you know, catching his third down passes, moving the chain, that kind of thing. But when your leading receiver is also a running back. That means you're not you're not attacking very far downfield, and you know we've seen the last couple of weeks. Virginia has done a great job stretching defenses, being able to get the ball down the field. That's what helps soften up your running game, you know, soften up the defense for your running game to then bludgeon teams to you know to death, so to speak, uh, which then in turn you know brings them back in and you go back over their heads. I mean, if the offense is working about as well as we can, the line's playing great, 
Defensively, the numbers aren't quite as good as they should be. Virginia's giving up 341 yards a game to opponents, but in the last two games, the last two the, the blowout wins, uh, we've seen a lot of yards, a lot of points given up in the fourth quarter on garbage time. Virginia's defense has been stout. Uh, so offensively, defensively, very strong. Special teams, not so much. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've had a couple of weeks to work on the kicking game, the coverage game, and that kind of thing. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, Scott, how it comes out. You'll be there. Uh, you know, see how things come out on Saturday uh, with, with uh, you know, the, the momentum having been stopped. Bronco talked about that in a press conversation. Too. He hated the bye week. He wanted to keep playing football. Your thoughts on that? I mean, when you're hot, you're hot. You want to keep playing. But I guess also it's, it's, it's a good chance to maybe lick your wounds a little bit and get everybody healthy, I guess. Well, if you're going to have, to, if you're going to have an off week, which every college team does, um, I'd say that was as good a time to have it, in my opinion, because how long has it been since a UVA fan has had this long to rejoice in being a UVA football fan? <laughs> we had, we've had, by the time we take the field Saturday, 15 days uh-huh. to rejoice that impressive win out in Boise, Idaho on a Friday night, national television. Um, it would have been nice to... I guess if you believe in the momentum, um, and momentum in baseball, they say momentum is only as good as your next day starter. Yeah. So it, I don't know how that analogy plays in football, but um, if we'd gone out and played, say, Duke or whomever the following Saturday, last Saturday, and laid an egg, uh, then we're not having this. We're not having this feel-good um, uh, conversation. And you don't know how the coaches have, you know, they're out. They're still laying the groundwork for recruiting. Um, you know, they've probably got a lot more kids showing up to be on the sidelines Saturday that they had originally because they had the extra time. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of intangibles in that that we don't know about. Real quick about about the defensive stats, you know. If you again using baseball analogy, and I haven't done this, you probably have. Last two games, we've we've blown, we've had teams, you know, just mop up time. Mm-hmm. We've been on the good side of that. If you take those two fourth quarters or the two last halves of the fourth quarter, when the game was in balance, I bet our defensive numbers look a lot more impressive. I did. I actually did the numbers, uh, ran the numbers in the last two games. Uh, Virginia gave up a total of 41 points in those last two games. 21 of those points from the fourth quarter of those games. Gave up 817 total yards in those two games. 282 of the 817 were in the fourth quarter. Uh, Virginia uh, had a 31 nothing lead on UConn and a 42-14 lead on Boise State. So those games were well in hand. You're getting guys, you know, you're getting young guys from reps, you're getting your veteran guys to break. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. That was, you know, I'll jump back Scott, to what you were talking about with the, with the bye week. It's, it was, it's been great for fans. Uh, you know, like you said, by, by the time they, they take the field Saturday, it'll be have been 15 days since the, 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 the big winner of Boise State. From a recruiting standpoint, yes, uh, your bye week is a very important recruiting week in the season. That's the time to go out and you, your, your staff starts to fan back out across the region to, to make those connections with, uh, reconnect with players and coaches. Now you get to go watch them in practice. You get to watch them on Friday nights and games. And I bet it was probably a little more exciting to have those D-hats on sidelines uh, after the big win over Boise State than it would have been uh, if, they, if they'd gone out there with an 0-4 record and just gotten their hats head, handed to them by Boise State. Uh, and then from a team standpoint, I wrote, I wrote about this after the, the Boise State game. Uh, as much as, you know, you want to go out and ride that momentum, the other side of it is, this is still a relatively young team in terms of learning how to win games. You know, this is a program that has not won a lot of games in the last 10 years, 11 years. And so uh, what happens often with a team that is not used to winning, you have a big win like that one out there. That's obviously a huge win for this program. And if you're playing right the next week, I mean, you know, maybe a day or two, you're, you're, you know, the guys' heads are full of sugar plums and dancing carries, you know, Christmas gifts on Christmas morning or whatever else. Uh, and, and their heads aren't where they need to be, which is getting ready for the next football game. You go out and you lose that game because you're still you're still emotionally reliving last week's game. Well, you know now all they've been able to do for the last week and a half is tackle each other, block and tackle each other, 
Uh, this is kind of like coming out of summer camp again. They wanted to hit somebody else up. Uh, so, good time. You know, if, 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 if he could have better scheduled that, they went at Boise State, give me a week off to get their heads back at the football game, and then let's play Duke. That, that's about as good as you can do because, you know, honestly, the, as far as the rest of the schedule goes, there's the ACC games and everything else, but, you know, there's not a Boise State-level opponent in terms of cachet really to tell your final game of the regular season against Virginia Tech. So it's not like there's going to be any more emotional roller coasters coming up. Uh, it's going to be week in, week out, let's go win some football games. But that Boise State game could have been an emotional roller coaster, go up and go way down. And so we've avoided that with a bye week. Exactly. And, man, what a great year to not to not have to see Clemson on the schedule or, <laughs> or maybe Florida State. But, uh, uh, I mean, Florida State certainly – Weakened by loss of the quarterback, but still, you know, they're very talented, very, very talented team. You know, college football, real quickly, I know we probably have to wrap up, but college football um, is so much different now. Um, it, it's so much – sometimes I think the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But when I was younger, um, you had your power team. You're five or six or seven, maybe teams that are perennial are going to be perennial top ten teams. Well, that really hasn't changed. You still have your Ohio State, your your Michigans, your Notre Dames, your Alabama, um, um, LSU's. But the parity when you drop down below that is just amazing. And a couple of reasons, and again, from from having spent some time with the next coach. A couple of reasons. First of all, the NCAA scholarship limitation, which was put in effect years ago, had a major impact on that. Play, schools like Texas that used to have 150 players on their roster, uh, literally 150 players. Yeah. When they took the field in 1979 against UVA, UVA took a team down to Texas that had a, a traveling party of 55, and Texas marched that on the field 150 they gave UVA the the thirty yard line in the end for pregame warm ups. <laughs> and Texas had from the thirty yard line up to midfield and down to the goal line for theirs. Um so scholarship limitation. The other big factor is nowadays you don't have to play at Alabama to be on T V every single game. Right. Right. You can a, a high school player can go wherever he wants if it's proximity to his home if it's, uh, you know, the academics, <laughs> i say that jokingly, uh, they, they know they're going to get seen. Um, the family doesn't have to try. The family can watch them. Uh, scouts maybe can see things on TV without actually traveling the game. So there's a lot of parity, and that's why a lot of this depth issue, you don't see these teams with um, two or three All-Americans, four uh, – Four star, four star recruits backing, standing on the sidelines, glorified cheerleading. So uh, that's where we're trying to reach, get to that yeah. level where we're where we're within we're in that group of teams that are pretty darn good on a year in year out basis. I don't know if we'll ever get to that level of Clemson or Ohio State. That's a different right now. It's a little different league uh, that those teams are playing in. Um, but you know that's 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 the direction we hope to be going in. I think it's a reasonable goal for Virginia to be where it was in the George Wells era. It took it took Wells a few years to get Virginia to that stage, but the stage he got to Virginia too was, hey, we'll win seven games a year, and that's back when you only played eleven. We'll go at least seven and four every year. Some years we might win eight. Some years we might win nine. If lightning strikes, we we'll, we'll win a conference championship. Uh, but. Uh, we'll always be in that mix. We'll always be playing big games in Charlottesville. We'll beat somebody on the road that maybe we should beat. We'll play in a bowl game, and, uh, you know, like I said, lightning might strike. And, and, you know, maybe you'll get a couple of good recruits and, and have a, a chance when they're seniors to do something special with that with that group. But I think Virginia State has to take that. You know, we got a little fat and happy. You know, we, uh, we kind of ra- railroaded George, got pushed him out the door. At the very beginning of the message board era of, of college sports, the late 1990s, early 2000s, fans got up in arms over only winning seven games every year. And I uh, thought, hey, we could do better than this. We could go win a championship. 
you know, we've we've learned since then that it's not quite so easy. What what George Welsh was able to accomplish at, at Virginia is there's a lot of factors that have nothing to do with on the field stuff and have everything to do with off the field stuff. That's that's one reason I was complaining a lot this summer. You know, the the, the situation was that the, the backup quarterback from Missouri we were trying to get in and he couldn't get into Virginia and he's at Vanderbilt now. And, uh, you know, if, if you're not going to let you know good athletes, good student athletes to come, come play, it, it makes it harder. But but that said, you know, it, it can be done. George did it, and uh, you know, and maybe Broncos turn the corner here. And uh, and and that's that's uh, you know, it, it, the win over Boise State gave us some hope. We're heading to Saturday. Uh, yeah, you're right, Scott. We'll, we'll 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 start wrapping up here. Scott's going to be the solo practitioner on Saturday in the press box. Twelve twenty kickoff. I've got a VMI game to do, so I'll be down the road, and I'm going to regret this one. I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll watch it on the app, uh, at least the first uh, first quarter or so. Uh, but Scott gets to have all the fun with the Duke game. He'll be leaving our live blog. Uh, join him on the blog. We'll have re- game, post-game recaps, reaction, et cetera. Uh, I'll try to get into the, into the mix uh, sometime later Saturday myself after my VMI game's over. Uh, but Scott's going to be there on our behalf. And, uh, yeah, so check out Augusta Free Press for everything about this game heading into the game and then, of course, on Saturday as well. Hey, Chris, do we dare do we dare want to make uh, two predictions? <laughs> I have, I have, I'll have. let you do. I'll let you do. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Make, make your call. Okay. My, I'm, I'm, I'm going to – we're going to see a, a, a competent UVA team that, that's going to play with uh, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of confidence. I think they – They've got to take. They know what victory tastes like. They've seen Duke. They saw Duke play Saturday night. Duke is not, um, you know, uh, informable t- team. Uh, I'm going to go UVA 27, Duke 20. UVA 20. I will. I will avoid giving a final score or even who I think will win. But I'll say this: a, a couple keys for Virginia in this game. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the Herb Street analyst uh, top out thing here, I guess, because even though I'm not doing this game as an analyst, uh, but I'll say the keys for Virginia, uh, only one turnover through four games this year. One turnover total. If, if Virginia plays another flawless game offensively in terms of not turning the ball over, they're hard to beat. Uh, I think, uh, you know, offensive line, as long as it protects Bankhood and clears some, some space for the running game, that'll be key. Uh, Duke has 18 sacks this year, most of the ACC. Virginia has given up the third least in the ACC sacks. So if Virginia can, you know, control the line of scrimmage offensively, uh, and I think I think Virginia defensively matched up really well with you. Uh, I really do. So if I was predicting a score, uh, I would go more, I mean, I think a little lower scoring game, I would go more Virginia 20, Duke 10. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Duke moves the ball against Virginia, and I think Virginia does enough to win this game. Again, that 20 to 10, I think, will feel more like Virginia in control, really, from the, about the middle of the first quarter on. I really think if Virginia goes out and plays that flawless game in terms of no turnovers offensively, uh, that they're a hard team to beat, and, and I, I don't see any reason why, you know, that they're not going to you know deviate from the game plan they've been playing so well so far this season. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go a little lower scoring, but I'll give Virginia the win too. We'll find out. Both of us taking UVA, so you talked me into it, Scott. <laughs> I, I knew if you kept talking long enough, you'd give me a prediction. Well, I it's hard to avoid it. So, uh, uh, so uh, 1220 kickoff, Scott's there. Uh, I'll be there in spirit, and uh, then we'll we'll catch back up later in the day on Saturday. We'll recap it for you. In fact, Scott and I will we'll get we'll try to get together and do a, a post game podcast here. It'll just be a little later than, than normal uh, because of my duties with uh, with BMI football. But uh, until then, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for Scott. Uh, thanks to Scott. Thanks uh, to all the folks listening out there, and we'll talk to you again soon.